I don't have like a focused, prepared talk I can give. There's a lot of things I could talk about, but I want to hear from you what would be most helpful. I could tell you about, uh, about what it's been like working as a scientist. We can talk about more about evolution and scripture if you want. Uh, we can talk about artificial intelligence and scripture if you want, and whether or not there could be artificial minds. We could talk about uh, science related to race if you want to, or human sexuality. Uh, or we can also talk about you and the things that you're working through and the questions you have. What I do know is that, uh, I mean, there's been good surveys done across the country of students like you. And one of the biggest questions, well, many of the biggest questions that students like you have is about science. And one of the hard things about it is that there isn't really a lot of people to talk to about it that really, really get both sides. And so if you feel like that, you can actually very feel, feel very alone. But the reason I'm even telling you that those survey statistics are out there is to let you know that you're not actually as alone as you think. There's actually a lot of people who are feeling that way. And what I really want to do here today is serve you by just being in community with you and just giving you a fun conversation partner, hopefully, and give me some information. And uh, maybe then you won't feel quite as alone and you'll also have some ways to, get, to think about this together. Sound good? So what do you want me to do? What do you, go ahead. Oh yeah, um, so there's a really good book that I actually would recommend. It's, it's, it's actually at a great level for you. It's called In Our Image by Noreen Hertzfield. She's a theologian and a computer scientist. She talks about the image of God and uh, artificial intelligence. I work with artificial intelligence. Um, there's a lot of really interesting questions that are arising about it because it's basically one of the most adaptable tools we've ever been able to make. And it can even fool us at times to think that uh, it's a human doing something when it's really not. Have you ever been surprised on Twitter when you find out it's a Twitter bot? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? But, uh, but even other things too, there's this really great video where it has Google Assistant calling restaurants and trying to get a reservation, and the person on their phone doesn't know it's a computer <laughs> doing it. That's, that's kind of weird, right? And of course, we all like science fiction, at least I do. How many people like science fiction? There's artificial intelligence there, right? It's, I can't even like give you a single movie or an archetype. They're all different. Um, back in the day, it was all everyone talked about HAL 2000, which you probably don't know about. But we could talk about the Terminator. We could talk about Cylons and Battlestar Galactica. We could talk about uh, the Terminator. Oh, you go down the list. Like there's a or you know uh, or her or I, I don't know which ones you guys are watching right now. And one of the big questions that's arising is, you know. Can humans, I'm sorry, can, yeah, can we actually make artificial intelligence that really has a mind? We haven't done it yet, and no one knows if it's even possible. We don't even know how to know if we've succeeded. <laughs> and, and it just really raises a lot of interesting questions. Some Christians think that the answer has to be no, because God has to intervene to make it possible. And because the idea of having a mind and a full personhood, that's something that's about the image of God, has to come directly from God, so humans can't do it. Other Christians aren't so sure, and there's a question mark over it. So another person to look to is Rosalind Picard, who's an artificial intelligence researcher at MIT. There's some really good videos by her. And, um, you know, and just puts a question mark over it, saying we don't really know, and why not find out? Except for I'm not really sure how we'd even know if we were successful, which creates an interesting question. Noreen's a theologian, a computer scientist, and I think her book is really good because she kind of explores this idea of like, you know, well, let's say even if we grant that the people who say it's impossible are correct, and that it really doesn't need God's act to, to do that. What we can actually throw into the mix is maybe we make a machine and then God actually puts a spirit in it. Who are you to say that God couldn't do that? Could God do that? Well, of course he could. <laughs> so could he spirit one of our machines at some point? Maybe he could. And, you know, what would we do? What would, it, what would that be like? And so I think these are really interesting questions that when it really comes down to it, we sometimes feel like there is a threat to our faith or a conflict with theology, but the reality, there isn't a conflict. It's just one of those grand questions about what it means to be human.
and we're invited to come and play there. It's not about really the answers at times, it's really about the questions. Does that make sense? So how much disagreement is there among secular scientists about evolution, is what you're asking? So um, I think the first thing to understand is that science doesn't work quite how the church does on this. We work, uh, like I said, you know, there's going to be debate on the precise particulars, but we generally work off of creedal statements in one form or another, whether it be a doctrinal statement. It's like basically, do you have sufficient agreement with this standard? If you do, then you're in this denomination this church, like you're LCMS Lutheran, right? You can express disagreement with maybe one or two things in the doctrinal statement that you gotta, you gotta disclose and then you kinda have to agree with the rest, right? And um, as Christians, you know, we're gonna say, well, do you believe that Jesus really rose from the dead? Have you made him your Lord? That sorts of things, and is that expressed in your life? These are gonna be core things and you kinda move forward from there. That's not actually how science works. Science doesn't care what you believe in your heart. Isn't that weird? So in a lot of ways, and for good reasons, the church is really defined, determined by what we're willing to affirm in our beliefs. Science doesn't work that way. It's actually much more of a process than an epistemology. It's about how are you gonna come to answers. And part of that epistemology is that we really value disagreement. And so how much disagreement there is, there's actually quite a bit of disagreement. And there isn't a belief statement you have to sign up on it. There's even a minority, a tiny, tiny minority of scientists that disagree with evolution. And no one really, usually really, you know, has a problem with it. Even if they're public about it, unless they start putting forward what scientists consider to be dishonest or bad science. That's where the line gets crossed. Um, so where, as a Christian who's a pastor who comes out and says, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I don't have a problem with gay marriage, that will create a ma massive problem to get kicked out, right? In contrast, in science, if you say, well, you know, this experiment, I saw X, but then the data shows, well, actually, no, it said Y, and you lied about it, that will get you kicked out. <laughs> Do you see the difference? They don't, we don't actually care if it's X or Y. We just care were you honest about what you saw. It's just a very different sort of uh, rules and communities. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll even tell you, there's even evolutionists that get into serious trouble for dishonesty. And what I'd say is that it's almost universal um, in among scientists that almost total agreement, we're talking like 99.99%, that when you look at gen the genetic data, it looks like we share common ancestry with the great apes. Meaning bonobos, chimps, and, and, uh, and uh, gorillas, right? And orangutans. That, that's, I mean, I, I, it's very hard to find any scientists that, that, that disagree with that, because the evidence is just very, very, very clear. Now, there are public, a tiny number of public scientists that dispute that. Um, I think it's gotten much harder since, you know, we've been able to sequence the human and the chimpanzee genome. Go ahead. So proto-human. So what I'd say is, first of all, we have to keep in mind that Scripture doesn't actually have the word human. Did you know that? Like in Genesis, do you know what word is used for mankind? Yeah, it's Adam. It's basically the proper name of Adam. It says the Adams. There's another way to say it if you're going to transliterate it. The literal translation in Genesis is that God made the Adams in the image of God, male and female. It doesn't actually say mankind, per se. It says the Adams. Isn't that weird? So it doesn't actually have the word human. The word human is actually a fairly modern concept. <laughs> yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> so clearly what's going on is the word Adam is being used to refer to this group that's male and female. Now there's been several different ways that's interpreted historically. There's, a, there's the Greek way, which actually says that Adam was first created with two heads four arms and four legs, and then when God took from the side, he was actually cutting him in half. 
That's where you get the sense of like, oh, I gotta go find my other half. That's from that old story, right? So that's one, I mean, that, that's fairly fringe, but, um, but what's going on is that it's very clear that Adam, well, basically Adam, this man who's made from the dust in Genesis 2, Adam is really a man named mankind. Isn't that weird? Anyways, that's kind of how mankind is defined in Scripture, as Adam and Eve and their descendants. And it, that's what the story of Scripture is about. It's about Adam and Eve and their descendants, who include all of us. We're all the descendants of Adam and Eve. Now, what does that tell us about people who had minds and souls or not souls or an image of God and all that um, that are not um, Adam and Eve? It doesn't really tell us anything because they're just not really the core part of the story of Scripture. Um, if you'll notice, it doesn't really tell us the precise details, and there's a lot of, been a lot of debate about how Satan fell. It doesn't really tell us who the Nephilim are. There's clearly other people entering into the story in Genesis that we don't know the old backstory, right? It's kind of like when you watch a movie, right? The movie follows a particular individual, and people will pop up into, their, into the story in a movie, right? And they have a backstory. And maybe you'll get a, a glimpse of the backstory, but is it really about them? No, it's about that key person, right? And, you know, if it's a really great franchise or whatever, maybe they'll make another movie that's about that group, right? <laughs> or that other person who came in. Uh, like, think about the Marvel franchise, right? <laughs> when you're watching the one on, on you know, Wolverine, you're not going to really learn a lot about, you know, whoever, uh, you know, whoever else might be. You're not going to learn much about the Phoenix, right? You're going to be learning about that. Maybe the Phoenix will enter into that story for a little bit. But it's not his story. It's not her story. It's his story. And so when you read Scripture in Genesis, it's clearly Adam and Eve's story and their descendant's story. That's what it's about. And that includes all of us, to be clear. And there's other characters entering into the story, and we don't know their full backstory. And it doesn't really matter, because that's not what the story is. And so, um, so this whole idea of humans versus proto-humans, you know, that's not even, that's, that's kind of like a very modern concept, kind of like the globe of the earth. Scripture isn't really talking about that. It's talking about someone else. Go ahead. What's my opinion of the Book of Enoch? So I think it's great. So the Book of Enoch, you guys know what that is? Um, so you, you guys are in these Young Earth Creationist curriculums, right? How many of you are Young Earth Creationists again? How many of you are Young Earth Creationists again? Okay, by the way, I'm not, I'm not freaking you out at all with this stuff, am I? Okay, good. Um, well, have you heard about the Ark Encounter and they have like a Colosseum with giants in it? Right? They have like a diorama with giants, like in a Colosseum battling dinosaurs and, and people and all that. Who are those giants exactly, and where do they come from? It turns out that, that, uh, that if you go about 200 years BC, people were starting to write biblical fiction, essentially. <laughs> and um, in the book of Enoch is this biblical, biblical fiction. So it's, it's called a pseudograph. So they were claiming it was written by Enoch, but everyone knew it wasn't written by Enoch. It was part of the part of just like, you know, like just having a good novel in that day. And they basically took the story of the Nephilim from Genesis 6 and kind of expanded it into this grand story that had, you know, angels interbreeding with, you know, the descendants of Adam and Eve to pr produce, you know, giants. And how different angels and different Nephilim were the custodians of different parts of the world. It's, it's, it's actually really, it's like, it's, it's totally science fiction. It's awesome <laughs> from 200 BC. One of the things I actually like about Billy Book of Enoch is uh, that they talk about a Messiah figure. And you know what the term is they use for the Messiah figure? The Son of Man. Does that sound familiar to you? It turns out that Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, which literally means the Son of Adam, by that title more than any other title. Now, Kurt is actually the New Testament theologian guy. I think that's right. Does that sound about right? No, no, that Jesus referred to himself by the title Son of Man more than any other title. Which is interesting, because you don't really see that title anywhere. A lot of people point to Daniel. But the thing about it is, the Book of Enoch was really popular at the time. It was kind of like the, you know, you know that was like one of the stories that people were telling. So it actually makes it very clear that that reference to the Son of Man was a messianic reference. 
when you have the Book of Enoch there. So you ask what I think about it. I think it's actually a really critical part of the cultural context. I don't think it was inspired like scripture, but one thing that it really does show us is that, that even back then, before evolution entered the scene, before deep time entered the scene and all that, people were just completely being clear that, yeah, scripture doesn't tell us everything. There's big questions, and there's a great deal of value in speculating and having fun trying to figure out and fill out the pieces in the mystery. Does that make sense? No. Go ahead. Sure. Well, so there's, you can mean different things by evolution. When I mean it, what I, I, I'm not meaning it to say that God wasn't involved in the process. You know, I think that God created all things. If we share common ancestry with the great apes, it's, it's because God foreordained that. He did it with a purpose, and it wasn't random stuff that just happened to be. It was God's intentional purpose. He knew it from the beginning of time, and this is just by how in his wisdom he chose to do things, okay? So sometimes people mean evolution to meaning God wasn't involved. That's not what I mean. Um, and sometimes mean purposeless, and it's kind of still continuing, right? but I don't mean any of that stuff. All I mean is what it really looks like, that it seems like we share common ancestry with the great apes, that if you go back far enough that there's, that there's organisms that gave rise to other organisms, that some of them went on to give rise to chimpanzees, and some of them went on to give rise to us. And God was involved in that process, and he did that directly. That was how he created us. And that doesn't preclude the idea that at some point in history, God stepped into the story of the species he created in his image and created from the dust without parents, Adam and Eve, just as it's described literally in Genesis 2, and especially created garden free of death with the tree of life. That, I mean, those two things could be true at the same time. And then, you know, as their offspring exited the garden, they encountered other people there, and they, they interbred with them. And that's where Cain got his wife. That's where he got people to populate a city. That actually explains the people outside of Retz or outside the land that he was scared of. And, you know, and that's okay. That's just, what, that's just a very natural, plain, literal reading of Genesis. You actually have to do quite a bit of non-literal reading to think that it's actually talking, or to think that a Retz means a globe. I mean, that's not a literal reading of the text. It takes a great deal of um, selective reading. I don't even understand how a literalist could come to believe that the garden extends across the entire earth. That just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, when I looked at the history, I found out that this whole idea that there was no death before the fall across the entire globe, that turns out to be a very recent idea. Um, it's less than 200 years old. If you go uh, before that, um, really in the church, um, that was just not a big deal. And it doesn't even arise in a mainstream denomination. Um, th these people are still Christians, though some people wonder at times. Have you guys heard of Seventh-day Adventists? Right. Are any of you Seventh-day Adventists? These are one of those Christians out there that are going to be a little bit weird when you first meet them. <laughs> they're nice people. I think they're going to heaven, to be clear. They're all vegetarians <laughs> because they believe because, I mean, they had, uh, Marietti Baker was their prophetess. They had about, you know, about 200 years ago or 150 years ago or so. And she, when she read scripture, kind of came to this idea, the way how she resolved the idea of, of evil in, in the world is by saying, well, that there was no death, no suffering, no disease, and then Adam and Eve sinned, and that's what entered across the world. And she envisioned that across the entire world. She was the earth creationist. There was a high value on the six days. Um, which is another interesting thing to talk about what actually days mean um, when you're talking about a globe, because there's actually no days on a globe. I can tell, that, tell you that in a moment. And so she had this view. It was very much like a very fringe movement in Christianity for a very long time. And, um, and you know, you guys have heard of the Scopes trial, right? Williams Jennings Bryan was arguing about evolution. Now, what's really interesting about this is that uh, he wasn't a young Earth creationist. He thought the Earth was old. He believed in deep time and all of that. Actually, most people at the time 
had this idea, most Christians had the idea that, you know, well, Adam and Eve lived at some point, maybe more ancient than 6,000 years ago, there was a garden, and then they spread out across the earth. And this whole idea of no death in the animal kingdom before the fall, they just didn't even have that on their map. It was really just Seventh-day Adventists until um, the Genesis flood was, was published in, in the 1950s or 60s, where basically that idea went mainstream. Uh, and young earth creationism as you encounter it today was really born as not really Seventh-day Adventist thing, but more of a fundamentalist idea. And so this is extremely recent, basically. Extremely recent that that way of reading scripture came out. And it makes sense when you look at the story. And if you're really going to take it seriously that in a perfect world there'd be no animal death, you'd be a vegetarian too. But I would tell you, most of you think a, a good steak or a piece of chicken is, is you know, part of God's good, goodness in the world, right? <laughs> and how does that make sense if animal death is a horrible evil? It doesn't actually make sense. <laughs> It doesn't actually make sense. So what's going on here is that, um, and I know there's a passage where it says now he started to give uh, to food, I mean, give, um, give animals to them as food. But that means, but the key point here is that the way I was talking about it is that's morally neutral about whether or not you actually kill an animal and eat it in, in important ways. Like, you didn't go say, oh, you can go, oh, now you can start, you know, killing and eating your firstborn son. <laughs> You would say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, that sounds wrong. So if you're going to say that, that means like actually killing this is not wrong, it was just more like a dietary law they had that was changed. Um, but that's not actually how Sixth and Seventh-day Adventists see it. They see it in a perfect world, that it will all be vegetarians, and that's how they live that way. Okay? I'm just trying to make the, the contrast here. It's actually far more consistent. And when you look at, you know, if you look at actually Seventh-day Adventism, they, I mean, they have an extra text they add to Scripture where a lot of this comes from. Now, if you actually look at Genesis, ignoring that tradition, it's very hard to come to this from Scripture because, like I said, it's very, very clear in Scripture, if you take a literal reading, that the garden had boundaries and that there was death outside the garden. The way how death comes to Adam and Eve is because they're kicked out of the garden and they no longer have access to the tree of life, which means that they were what some people would say is conditionally immortal. They were made immortal because they were in the garden and had access to the tree of life. But if they weren't in the garden, then they would not be immortal. I mean, that is like the clear teaching of, of, of Scripture. Well, it literally says we can't let them stay here if they're not going to be executed. We need to make sure they don't reach out and take the tree of life, so we need to get them out of the garden. Yeah. So that's true, but, but the question is, what is the tree of life? So some people have said the tree of life was Christ. Some people have actually argued, argued that in history. Well, it's complicated. Um, so, well, what I'd say, Scripture says, it doesn't talk, it says that they disobeyed and they were supposed to die for it, but then they didn't die. No, there's two trees. There's the tree of life, and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They took the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, so the thing that presses on that is that in the very next chapter, you see God hanging out with them because he still stick, stuck around with them. Because he went with them into the garden, he helped them actually set up their farms, and he's sitting there figuring out what to do with Canaan. And Abel was able to access them and talk to him. So God actually exited the garden with them. And then they didn't die. It says that you'll day, eat, die the day you eat of it. So this is one of the tensions in the text. So some people have said, well, actually, they did die, but that demonstrates... So actually, uh, Augustine's literal interpretation of Genesis is really valuable. What he says, I think... This is one view. He says that 
God said the day of it you will die, but then he didn't die, so what's going on? And then he comes up and says, actually, the most literal translation is to say that he did spiritually die that day. His spirit died that day. No, I'm just saying, let me finish what I'm saying. I'm giving you some information. So um, his spirit died, and for God's point of view, spiritual death is far more literal death than physical death, is what he argued. That's one view. The other view is to say, you'll be condemned to die that day, but that's not actually what the text says, so some people have argued that. Another view is to say that he was actually supposed to be executed, but then God showed him mercy and exiled him instead. I think that one actually makes the most sense. Does that, does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, well, the, the, the punishment for eating of this is to die that day. He eats of it, and then they say, and then God doesn't kill him, and then all of his counselors are like, wait a minute, if you're not going to kill him, we can't let him stay here and eat of the tree, we've got to kick him out. And then he gets kicked out. Possibly. I do think that if you're going to say the day that you eat of it, you're going to die, it's hard to get away from saying it means immediately. Um, Yeah, so what I would say is what's being taught in schools is not atheistic evolution. But it's also not the word God. It's not theistic evolution either. It's just this, just what we're seeing in the science, which is more neutral than that. But this gets to the issue, too, about what's the role, what role do we really think the government and you know, society should be playing in relation to the gospel and teaching of scripture. Now, there's many different reasons why kids get put into homeschool. One reason is that some people are very skeptical of the secular school system teaching their kids. Is that part of the reason why your parents chose to homeschool you? Okay. Now, that's okay. I think there's a real value in that. But here's the issue. You're growing up and you're gonna be entering the real world soon. That's what happens for everyone. Even if they had put you in the secular school system, at some point, you'd be leaving the house really soon. And if you're in the secular school system, you're gonna be leaving the house soon too, right? One thing that's going on in the American church is we're trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that we've had a lot of control and power in the world, and we're losing that power. And for a long time, you know, for example, people could pray in, in schools. Uh, you know, teachers could pray with students directly and things like that. Now the rules have changed. Now, students can pray with, with students, but teachers can't do that, and we're not really sure what to make of that. <laughs> um, and there is the sense that, you know, Christianity is not having some of the same opportunities in the public square. But I do think that, that this is actually where looking at the diversity of the church really helps us, not just the United States, but beyond the United States. We can ask ourselves, how has the church done in places where it's not even had hope of power? where it's been a total minority, where, uh, where things like truly atheistic evolution was taught in the school system and no one was allowed to homeschool. And in fact, churches weren't even allowed to actually congregate in large numbers, like, I mean, like, like China. We could ask, you know, what happens when, when the government does that? And what we found out in China is that when that happens, that the church just withers and dies. Wait a minute, that's not what happened. 
Do you know that there's more Christians in China than there are in the United States? <laughs> exactly. What we found out is that when the church doesn't have power, that for some reason that doesn't, well, I mean, when you think about it, what's going on here? If the church was a human movement, that would be a major problem. If the church depended on government power and human power, that'd be a major problem. But, but you know, the Communist Party in China, with all the lovers of power, cannot bind the work of the Spirit in calling forth his people. And I'd even say that the Chinese church, for all of its flaws, and it does have flaws, is thriving in ways that we should be jealous of as an American church. So if that's what's ahead, I don't actually think we should be quite as concerned as we sometimes act. Um, I, think, I think what we can find out is that you know, when we're kind of in this place of feeling threatened because we don't have control over it, and we think it's because they did this that these guys are atheists or not following and trusting that, that's actually not how it works. God is going to ensure that the gospel is heard. And there's going to be people that, 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 you, that you don't even know how they got there that heard the call of Christ and came to follow him. There's a really, uh, you guys know Chronicles of Narnia, right? There's a really key scene in it where there's, uh, where the kids are talking to one of their mentors about Aslan, and they ask, is he safe? You remember what the response is? Uh, it's, it's, it's like, well, you know, he's not, he's not safe, but he is good. I think sometimes what we want is a domesticated cat when it comes to our to, to God, but really what, what he is is an untamed lion. And frankly, lions are scary things. They're a lot bigger than you think. You know, when they're playing around, they could bat you and it could break you. I have a two-year-old at home, a one-and-a-half-year-old at home, and a four-year-old at home. I get terrified when I see the two of them roughhousing, because that four-year-old, he bends the wrong way, he can break this one-and-a-half-year-old, right? And I know this because I rough house with them too, and every now and then I just do something that really hurts my four-year-old. <laughs> it's accidental, it's just because I'm bigger than him, right? And I'm playing with him and that can happen. And you know, honestly, it's, as he's gotten older, he's had started to kind of grow a little bit of a healthy sense of danger when he plays, which actually is what makes it fun, right? He knows that, that you know, as he's engaging with me, <laughs> I really am good, I'm not trying to hurt him, but he can't go do something stupid either, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's gotta be careful. I think we have to understand that God is not like a, you know, a one and a half year old that can do no harm to us. <laughs> he is so much bigger than us. He is not controlled by us. He can do damage. He's good to be clear. And he's far more, uh, he's, you know, he's not careless like I can be. So I'm not trying to say he's a clumsy dad, <laughs> but he's an untamed lion. He's not a house cat. And so when we see things like this, I just want to tell you, when you think about like, the educational system and how evolution is being taught, or in the textbooks, yada, yada, you know, I just don't care about that as much because I'm just convinced that God is greater than that. I mean, aren't you convinced of that too? I think that even if we gave them everything that we, they want there, that the church would still go on <laughs> in the ways that, whatever way that it needs to, because that's not actually what the crux of the matter is. Oh yeah, of course. But how will we figure that out? It's going to be through dialogue. Yeah, but what we just find out empirically is that Christians still, with the Holy Spirit involved, doing the best they can, still end up disagreeing on important things. And that's okay. I think that's part of how God designed it. He didn't want any of us to have that much power. This is a great, great question. So what are we communicating to people, though? 
are we communicating a set of beliefs that they have to agree to? If that's what we're trying to communicate, then this is a disaster. But that's not actually what it is. Like I'm telling you, what we're doing is we're introducing people to a person. We're inviting them into a relationship with a person. We're inviting them into a family with other people that know that person. And part of the fun of that family is having really raging debates, maybe about things that no one else cares about because we're, they're a family debate. <laughs> right? And, and still having love at the end of the day. You know, that, that, that's the joy of it. So what happens is, if that's what it is, if it's more that relational context that, you know, that we all encountered this living presence in the world that's real, that they can access to, that's connected to this actual act in history of this man, Jesus, rising from the dead. Let's just say that that's what we're trying to communicate. Isn't that a crazy idea? Tell them about Jesus. If we're trying to introduce them to Jesus and to the people who follow Jesus, then what it means is that we're supposed to, when there's that non-Christian sitting next to a Christian and a Christian that disagree with one another, we want to show them that we're a family that loves each other. And what do families that love each other do? Do they say, we're just going to agree to disagree, just don't ever talk about that for me in front of me? Is that what families will do that love each other? Well, no, I don't actually think that that's real love. I think real love has understanding. I mean, Proverbs is really clear about that. So, you know, what, what, it, what a good family does is it says, you know, I don't agree with you. That makes sense to me. And I'm not going to try and control you right this moment because you're an adult. Let's just say you're not like a tiny kid. Maybe trying your kids to try and control. Say, hey, I want to understand this. Let's just talk about it. I want to understand you. And I want to care about you. This makes no sense. I think you're crazy, but I love you, and I want to know about this. If that's our response and say, you know, you're saying that from Scripture, but it makes no sense to me, can you show me how you get there? Now, in that inquisition, that type of inquiry, that exchange, if that other person does the same and enters into it, there can be a real opportunity to understand one another. I'll tell you what, it's counterintuitive, but, but people are actually very likely to change their points of view in that moment. You can get into a little bit of the psychology of it. Um, do you know, you know that feeling you get when a person comes to you and disagrees with you? Maybe you're even getting that right now, I don't know, where you kind of have the adrenaline kick in, you kind of get into like that fight or flight response. And so some of us are kind of conditioned to say, oh, and then run away, <laughs> right? And then others of us are convinced to get into that and then fight. <laughs> and maybe it's different, different situations. You get what I'm saying? How many people here are runners? Okay, there's some runners. How many people are fighters? Okay, there you go. <laughs> All right, here's the thing. If you're running, you're not going to change your mind. Right? If you're fighting, how often do people change their mind when they're fighting? Frankly, the real temptation is to just argue your point and not admit you're wrong there because you don't want to admit that you lost. You lost, even if you know you're wrong. So here's the thing. If you're trying to convince someone of something, one of the worst things you can do is trigger their fight and flight response. Because if that happens, you're going to lose no matter what. You're going to lose a person. Even if you're entirely correct, if they're in the fight or flight mode, they're not with you anymore. So if you actually are convinced that the guy is entirely wrong, if you're convinced that he's on the path to hell because of what he's doing, okay, the right response if you love them is not to go all out and say, you're wrong, you're not part of our community, do that, say, it's like, you, the right response, the way that has the most chance of changing their mind is to say, you know what, I don't understand you. I don't want to get in a fight with you about it, I'm not trying to change your mind, that's the irony of it. If you actually enter in honestly saying, I don't want to change your mind, I just want to understand. And just calm down and just ask questions to understand, do that. And what's beautiful about this is that this is the right response whether you're right or wrong. If you're right and they are completely on the path to hell, this is the right response to take. If you're wrong and what they're saying isn't that crazy, this is the right response to take. If you're so wrong that you're the one on the path to hell, this is the right response to take. Because either way, it gives you an opportunity to actually see truth together. That's the right response for the two blind men sitting next to each other fighting. It sits down and say, okay, wait a minute. I just want to understand you. Help me understand. And it will actually clarify who is the confederate there, who is the mafia who's lying to everyone. When you sit down, it's very hard to lie when people are trying to take you at your word to understand you and clarify. It's just very hard to lie. It just it actually ends up exposing you when you slow down. Actually, when you're lying, what you're typically doing is you're trying to trigger the fight and flight response in your audience towards someone else. Does that make sense? Um, 
And because that distracts entirely and you're going to win. You're going to say, oh, all these people are trying to do this. Don't trust them. It gets everyone riled up. And it doesn't even matter at this point if what you said is true or not because we've identified who the enemy is and that's where we're going. So that's what liars do. <laughs> that's what dishonest people do. So if you kind of sit saying, hey, you know, we just disagree. I want to understand. It makes sense. I mean, I want to understand. It actually makes people who try that strategy even more upset, which is pretty, it kind of exposes them for what they are too. If a person, for example, says, you know, when I read scripture, I just don't see evidence for X. And I've read it closely. If they're lying to you, when you start really wanting to get into that with them and have them explore it to them, it'll kind of expose really quickly that they don't know what the heck they're talking about and they haven't really looked at it closely. But if they're being truthful, they're going to actually go to sit down and explain it to you. Maybe you'll see something new in scripture or maybe you'll show them something that they missed. So that's actually why that is the correct response no matter what. There's no other response you can give that will be correct in every situation. Does that make sense? Uh, even now, uh, yeah, sorry, one, we got about five minutes, so this might be one or two more questions. Go ahead. I would say I affirm evolution. I believe in Jesus. He's the one who rose from the dead. Oh, I think God created all things. But literally what it says in Genesis is not planets. It says literally the land God created. I mean, we can't get around that issue. Now, I do think that correctly so, it's evocative of the idea. I mean, I think the fact of the matter is that Genesis has, has many layers of meaning. One of the meanings that it's trying to convey is that everything that was made and has been made was made by Christ or made by God. And that gets repeated also through scripture too. So God is a creator of all things. And that's also in the creeds. Everyone who has read Genesis has understood it to mean that God is a creator of all things. Or not Genesis, at least scripture. Everyone who's believed that. Some people debate about Genesis, to be clear. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, if you look at the full teaching of Scripture, every Christian I know believes that everything that has been made has been made by Christ, by, by, made, my, made my God. But that's not the question here. The question is, what actually is Genesis saying? And it is not saying that in a direct way or in a literal way. What it is literally saying is that God made their rats, the land. And it goes on to say that there's a Dama, there's a Aretz, and then, you know what? Cain ends up leaving the Aretz. He didn't go to another planet. He just moved a little bit farther away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, that's the, so some people have argued that there was no people out there and the fear was just a sign of a sin. But what's interesting about that is that God actually endorses that fear by putting a mark on him. Why did he have to put a mark on him to warn everyone? That actually um, implies that there was actually even knowledge of God out there beyond the rats. So that, that word, the land, that it interprets there is the same word that's used for the earth. So it says that God made a ret, and then it made a dama where, um, where God made Adam, which is the garden. They get banished from the, Adam, uh, from the, the garden, the dama, and they're out in their rets, which is still this blessed area. It's kind of in the outer courts of the, of, of the, of the temple of the garden. And then, and then Cain gets banished from a ret. So if you're going to read this literally within context, what it's saying, if you're going to interpret a ret as the globe, is that, that, that Cain was banished from the globe of the earth and he somehow ended up on the moon or, or Mars or something? And how did he get there? <laughs> That's how broken it becomes if you're gonna try and read it in, you know, all in context. What it's saying is that a rat is a particular area. There's, there's just, it's just very hard to get around that. Um, if, you're, if you care about a literal reading, that is. And I mean, some people would say it's all figurative. I, I'm not sure if I'm willing to go that far, but I mean, if a literal reading is, is important, I mean, that's what you're left with. So, uh, so it, that's literally what it says, is that God made a ret. Uh, now, what is a ret? It's not the globe of the earth. Did God create all things? Absolutely. Now, one way how people have read this is they note, they'll note that there's actually several creation accounts. And if you read Genesis 1 and 2, it's, it actually says that God created everything. In the beginning, God created, created all things. That's how some people interpret it. 
So, that was, so some people said, well, God created everything. But then, you know, at a later point, there was like it was formless without an void, and then he created the Eretz. Well, I mean, now we're starting to wonder, wait a minute, so creation of everything happened before the six days. How much later? Well, it actually doesn't say. And, um, and so for a long time, there's this idea, which makes a lot of sense, is the ruin and restoration idea, the, the idea that God had made stuff, done stuff. Uh, there's a whole story back there that we don't know about. Because that, that isn't our story, remember? You know, when you, when you um, watch a movie, that's an origin story. What's a good origin movie you've watched? It's about the, how the particular s superhero comes to be. Spider-Man. Spider-Man is a good one, right? He gets bitten by a, by a spider, right? And goes forward. Now, the movie starts at a particular point in the history, right? In Medi Res. It's the beginning for this guy, but, you know, it's not even, even the fully the entire beginning for him. Does that mean the entire world was created then and there was nothing before? Well, no. I mean, this guy has parents that just weren't talked about because the story isn't really about them. It's about something else, right? That, that's a key point of how stories are told. They have a beginning that is contextual. And if you read Genesis, it's very clearly contextually bound to who Adam and Eve are and their descendants. So then there was a backstory about, you know, who is the serpent and why, did he, why is he out there doing wrong? You know, where did the angels fall? When did they fall? That's another big question that's been there for a long time. And people have wondered, hey, maybe, maybe that happened in that whole ruin period before when the garden was created. And this is just where the story picks up again when Adam and Eve were created. That makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, that's, that seems to be very close to a literal reading. I think actually going far away from that creates a lot of tensions that I don't know how to resolve when you look at the actual text of Genesis. Does, does that make some sense? Go ahead. So you have to understand, once again, that their concept of the moon was different than ours. They, they, they saw a light in the sky. And, and the word isn't even moon or sun. It says the greater light and the lesser light. So that's my question. My question is, Yeah, so this is actually worked out about... 500 years ago, there's a really good, if you get a moment, um, and maybe I can send you a copy of it, is to read the Introduction to Astronomy and Nova by Kepler. Kepler was a Christian, and he's one of the key people who actually uh, figured out that the moon is actually a globe, and that it's actually in the laws of gravity and all of that. And he got a whole ton of scriptural objections based on geocentrism, some of the things you're talking about. And what I really loved about his the introduction to Astronomy and Nova is he sits down and actually engages all those scriptural objections. I think that's actually worth reading to understand how he made sense of that. And I think he's completely correct in how he did that. All right, so I gotta, get, I gotta be done now. Um, and, but it was really fun talking to you guys. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the questions and, and for engaging with me.